And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. Coming to us straight, coming to us straight from the land, the land of, uh, oh, the, oh. The land of dolphins, heat, eh, and Florida man, and creator of the of the upcoming comic, The Veil Walker Number One, the one and only Stefan Velez, or as he's better known, Oasi V. How are you doing tonight, man? I'm doing pretty well. Thank you so much for having me on and uh, welcoming me to your most holy of temples. Uh, I am not much. Of a religious man, but I am definitely here for this, and I am all about it. So, mm -hmm. thank you. So, I'd like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um, walk me, th walk me through how you first got introduced to comics and the um, chain of events that led to you getting the writing bug. Yeah, I mean, like any. 90s kid, you know, born in the 90s or the late 80s. It, it was the animated series. It was Spider-Man. It was X-Men. The Batman animated series. And then Toonami sort of just came around and, and blew all that up in the late 90s, early 2000s. So really it was animation first. Uh, I moved into anime, Dragon Ball Z and all that. And I didn't actually start picking up comics until my early 20s. Because I would get a comic here and there uh, when comic books were still readily available at some grocery stores or some, some CVSs or whatever you had in your area. Mm -hmm. Right Aids. You know, I would pick up the random trade if my mom had the money for it or uh, if, a, if a toy I got had a comic in it. I remember I got a toy, and I forget his name, a, a toy of the guy that has the long hair and the two swords. Uh, I think it's one of Jim Lee's creations. I can't really remember. Um, uh, are we ta are we talking Marvel? It, it is. I think it is Marvel. Yeah, yeah. Um, long orangey red. As I got a little. Older in my early twenties, uh, I met up with some friends who were some huge nerds, and they were like, "Dude, you you need to stop watching these animes and actually start reading comic books." And then that's when I got into it, and uh, the bug hit almost immediately because I wanted to be a video game uh, creator first. I wanted my stories to be, you know, action RPGs. But when we saw how absolutely crazy it was to to fund a project and actually even get some eyes on it. I was like, all right, so what's our second best option? So we were like, oh, comic books. That's you know, it's it's a cheaper, easier option to get into. Oh boy, that was uh, I was wrong. It was not all that much cheaper, but but here we are. Uh, we felt that we can make some great content. Me, my editor, and my buddies, and and so far, I think we're we're able to deliver. Mm -hmm. So, what I do find it, what I do find interesting. Given given the talk up, given the talk of that, is as I recall in one of the pitches that you put up on Twitter, um, you had you had you had brought up um, Spawn as a point mm -hmm. of comparison. Um, were you, how did you, how did you first get exposed to Spawn? Was it through the comics? Was it through the animated series? Um, it was the animated. It was if I'm not. It was the movie actually. The live action movie they made a long time ago. Mm -hmm. It was that. And then from there, I think, is when that HBO Spawn series was airing. And uh, the animated series. So then I watched that. Mm -hmm. And then I've gotten more into Spawn, you know, in, in the early 20s. In my early 20s is when I actually started reading Spawn. Uh, but yeah, so most of my inspirations first come from, like, the visual motion, the motion picture sort of. So. Mm-hmm. And then I started to develop that further as I got older. Uh, but yeah, my first exposure to Spawn, like a lot of us, I'm pretty sure, was that that movie. 
I um, <laughs> I have I, for for me personally, my intro my introduction to the character spawn was a little bit unfortunate because it was the PS one game. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, how I ended up becoming a spawn a a fan of the character afterwards is a miracle because Spawn the Eternal is considered one of is, is repeatedly put on top. T- um, worst ten list when it comes to bad PS One games. I vaguely remember having it, and not having it. There was a blockbuster around the corner from my house, and mm-hmm. I used to go every weekend. I miss being a kid, man. My old lady would get home from work at like four, or four or five. She'll make us dinner if she felt like it. If not, we would go to blockbuster. She'll give me a game for the weekend, mm-hmm. pick up some pizza. And my life was just, it was a dream from there forward. So I vaguely remember picking up Spawn uh, at Blockbuster uh, and not maybe getting past maybe like the first level and just giving up on it. Yeah, it was very hand-breaky. Um, but of, of course, of course, he is not exactly stellar. I'd say a lot of it so wait, is... Hmm? I was just going to say, how did you get into Spawn after that being your first exposure to the character. About a what year. What was the redemption? Uh, um, I'd say, th- I'd say the, re- I'd say the redemption was, th- was the fact that the, the, the big chain, the big, um, hobbyist chain in the Twin Cities area was, um, Shinders. And, like you had that, you had, you had, and I had a couple bookstores within relative walking distance to where I was at the time, and the library was in walking distance. So, okay. anytime, anytime that I had off time, I was spending my time in either, in either, either Shinders, one of the bookstores, or the library, just reading every single thing I could get my hands on. It's not my fault that the book that the bo- that a lot of those places had a nice couch for me to s- nice couch for me to sit on and read. <laughs> Um, and through, and, um, I remember, I remember, I remember that, I remember, um, right around that, right around that time, I was, I was really big into Ghost Rider. Still am. I was always, I was always more into the, um, supernatural end of superhero universes. And, um, then a friend of a friend recommended, um, recommended spawn to me and i ended up diving into it and i ended up very much enjoying it then after that i found out about the movie and and then and um and then then found out about more because for a lot of a lot of people there's that whole divide between whether or not they focused on on anime or they focused on comics for Mm -hmm. me that divide didn't exist both of i ended up growing up with both of them joined at the hip. Yeah. Which has given me an interesting perspective ever since, but that... Be- I... Go ahead. No, no, continue. I'm sorry. But beca- because because of that, um, whenever whenever I'd look, whenever I'd look into um, se- stories within sequential art, um, there, would al- there would always be this kind of cross-pollination, and I think the ultimate case in point with that with that kind of cross pollination is that short lived spawn manga. I don't recall that. I do not recall ever seeing that. Um that that came around in the early two thousands where where it was asking a question of what, what if it what if um what if the hell spawn had bonded to it to a uh, ja- to a Japanese guy. Was um, it a Yakuza member? No, he was he 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 knew he knew karate but he was just—he was somebody at the wrong place at the wrong time. And See, they dropped the ball. I would have just made him a yakuza member that went to hell. Um, as interesting as that would as that would have been as that would have been, um, <laughs> there, there's um, when tra- when trying to, when trying to portray yakuza in anime and manga, you've got to be careful. <laughs> um, but. When it comes to, like, in the same in that same vein, around the time that I found out about that movie, 
I found out about the live-action Giver movie, which um, I, they don't they don't seem to have any they wouldn't have anything in common. But but the whole thing of a orga of a organic a organic suit that is put on and off in that fashion is one of those is one of those things that kind of that kind of allow them to become a Venn diagram with each other. Um, right. And of course, of course, the, of course, the rest is history. Although, um, I will, I will admit some. I will admit that um, as much as people, as much as people, as much as people slammed the '90s, it was definitely an it. It was definitely an interesting time when it came to when it came to com- when it came to comics outside of the big two. Um, of course, we had a boom. We had a boom. You know. Uh, with comic books kind of blowing out of the big two, and Image, if I'm not mistaken, came out of the '90s. Um, yeah. What was what was Jim Lee's studio? Was it Wildcats? Right. Wild, came out um, the, Wildstorm, Wildstorm Studios. Wildstorm, right? So that came out in the '90s. So a bunch of these revolutionary, and I don't really well, let's not say revolutionary, but a lot of these huge characters that are still somewhat relevant today. Mm-hmm were created in the 90s by these sort of independent studios and just got bought up again. So yeah. I think where we are right now in indie comics is sort of a similarity to what was going on in the 90s. Although so I, I think there's going to... Yeah, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. If there's, a, if, there's any, if there's anything I find kind of funny with the story of Image, it is the conversation that ha- that happened with Mar- that happened when... Um, when they when they were debating leaving, because they had they had um, McFarlane, Lee, and um, so and I think and so Sil- and um, I think so Sil- I think Silvestri um, had and I may, and don't quote me on that I'm referring to the guy the guy behind um, Top Cow the guy behind Witchblade and um, the Darkness yeah um, they had they had. Uh, they they had gone to Marvel with an ultimatum. They were doing Image. That was that was not up for debate. It's just a matter of are we doing it under the Marvel umbrella or are we or are we doing it on our own? If we're doing right. it on our own, we're not working with you. And one of the guys, one of the Marvel execs at the meeting had said had said, and this is you can chalk this up to the most tone deaf things you could say. <laughs> and I quote: "There's always there's always someone else to pick the cotton." Oh God! Oh my God! That that would have I would have immediately said, "All right, cool, thanks. You have made our decision that much easier." I don't know if I don't know if if that if if that was if that was the final final say, but um, it but the my. But the mindset. Well, I think even I think even before that, just the fact that they that they wanted a bigger say in cre- in creative decisions with what they were working on um, was was the um, br- was the deal breaker. Since yeah. all if you look at a lot of the stuff that the image guys have said have said since, they've always been very big on the idea of creators owning their work. Yep. And yeah. As much as as much as um, people pick on have people picked out on on um, Liefeld and even McFarland called him the idiot, especially when he especially when he was not happy about um, Shatterstar being revealed to be gay. His whole when you actually look at what his issue was, it actually ends up making sense because his issue was the was the fact that he had never written that kind of thing in and he, and and that kind, and was and um. Was never consulted about that about making that kind of change to a character he created. I'm not completely defending the the guy because he certainly has earned his reputation, right? But um, but it's one thing to put in perspective. Um, uh, I'll say this to piggyback off of that, right? Mm-hmm. As as a creator, there was a long time where my dream was that Alexander and the Veil Walker get picked up by one of the big two mm-hmm. or even image right so that i can actually have you know the veil walker face to face to spawn a character that played a huge role in inspiring him to begin with that would have been great for me 
But as I saw what was happening with these characters, and as I'm sitting around seeing what um, they're doing to to IPs that they didn't create, and they're not consulting the actual creators, mm -hmm. I was like, can you imagine what they would do to the Veilwalker and Alexander if you know for X or Y reason I get booted off of the board, I get it booted off as writer or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that kind of made my decision so much easier to say, you know what, I'm kind of going over here, uh, throwing my hat in with this group because, honestly, it, it's the right way to go. If I want to, com com uh, co to hold complete control mm -hmm. of the Veil Walker and I want to tell the story that I've been working on for damn near 10 years, this is the way to do it. Yeah. And, uh, and, yeah, I, I feel you. Yeah, he's a... Uh, God, I can't. I can't imagine what changes that would make yeah. to a character like this. Now, what I find what I find interesting is that is that um, even w even with the darker tone with a lot of stuff that came out of the '90s, the supernatural end of things is still, in the bigger scheme of things, a road less traveled. Mm -hmm. Like I, me I mentioned, Go I mentioned Ghost Rider, but beyond that, of of course, um, there's been the big sorcerers for Marvel and DC. Doctor Strange and Doctor Fate, um, but some, but um, there's also there's also been stuff like um, Valiant Shad Valiant um, Shadow Man. Well, at least it was, at least it was part of Valiant ar around that time. Um, were you were did you have a lot of when you were reading and taking inspirations? Spawn notwithstanding, were were you heavily influenced by the by the more supernatural kind of stories? Yeah, so. As any kid, right, I used to read a lot of, like, the R.L. Stein books. Mm -hmm. And, you know, horror has always been a genre that I've enjoyed immensely. I've been really disappointed with some of the movies that have been coming out recently, but that's a, that's a story for another day. Uh, horror has always been there for me. I really do enjoy it. And, uh, and yeah, there are stories like John Constantine, like, the actual movie. Mm -hmm. Is one of my favorite movies of all time, even though people like kind of crap on it sometimes. But I love that Constantine movie with Keanu Reeves. You know, uh, not everything needs to be a masterpiece for it to be enjoyable. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there there were there were some movies that that I I saw that really inspired that. Um, but where I kind of where I kind of drew that line in the sand and said, you know what, I want this character to be somewhat supernatural and somewhat horror genre and that as you mentioned that role less traveled was when I did look into it and I'm like there's not a lot of characters like this right there have there hasn't been another spawn in nearly what 20 years so that's when I was like yeah we're gonna lean full into this and we're really gonna develop this world and I think there's a lot of grown up you know, Harry Potter fans and a lot of supernatural fans uh, that are really going to enjoy this book mm -hmm. because we did decide to go with that. And for a lot, for a lot of people, the ma the the main um the main char the main character archetype of of some of someone who prote who protects people from the things that go bump in the night is. Along the, is along the lines of stuff like Hellboy, although I'd say Hellboy is less um, is less horror and more um, pulp. Right. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just a case of apples and oranges. Right. Whereas, from what I've seen, from what I've seen of the proof of concept and what you're going with, you're go you're going with a very um, ho a very horror action type of type of approach. The ve dealing with it, dealing with someone who is. At least, at least in some regard, a heroic figure having to combat against horrors. Right. He he is, and I love when when The Witcher uh, did this, um, and I really wanted to lean into that. The Witcher did a lullaby story or a lullaby song that was from the point of view of the monsters. And they were singing the lullaby to their little little baby monsters about this big bad witcher. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I love that. I was like, he is their boogeyman. Right? Um, 
but Alexander itself is, if I could say, is not really heroic. Because without giving too much away, he, what he does, who he defends, and who he protects, for a very selfish reason. He is doing it for himself, and if he manages to save a few people along the way, then great. Mm-hmm. Now, why is he doing it for himself? That's the bigger mystery uh, that we're going to be touching upon chapter after chapter, arc after arc. Uh, we're just going to be laying a few of those pieces here uh, in the first five to six issues. Mm-hmm. And uh, hopefully that is enough to to keep people coming back for the next eight or ten years. Because this is a really long story. And speak, it's funny that you bring up um, The Witcher because... As somebody who's go- has gone through has gone through the gamut with that series, mm-hmm. um, there's all when it comes to de- when it comes to dealing with monsters, there's always specific um, methods. I won't I won't say rituals per se, but all but specific methods that are that are outlined when it comes to tr- when it comes to tracking them, keeping an eye on their habits, their movement patterns, and how and how to take advantages of their weaknesses in combat, or even, or even if fighting them is something that's advi- that's advisable to begin with. Right. Um, is there a, is there a similar thing with how Alexander operates, where there, where he has a lot of knowledge about the supernatural and its and its habits? Yes. So Alexander is a career. Uh, I guess we can call it monster hunter, right? Um, mm-hmm. So he kind of has quite a bit of experience in regards to dealing with everything that does go bump in the night. And yeah, there are certain things that we're, we're really, I don't want to call it copying, but being influenced by, mm-hmm. you know, not just things like The Witcher, but again, Constantine and how, you know, different monsters have different rituals or different spells. So what mm-hmm. we're doing is we're putting our own twist on sort of that, that motto. I'll, uh, I'll give you guys a bit of a spoiler here. So, for example, silver, right, has been notoriously used as a anti-monster weapon. Mm-hmm. You know, if we stick with the, with the Witcher, it's uh, steel for men, silver for monsters. Is that mm-hmm. how it goes? Yeah. Right? And then the silver bullets for werewolves and all that. But no one has ever been able to explain why. Like, kind of why is it that silver is, is used in this fashion? Mm-hmm. So we actually did some research, studied sort of the compound of silver compared to gold, compared to steel, and we were able to come up with a reason why that is. And it is not just the silver. uh, I don't know how much I can say here, but you know what? I'll give it away. I'll give it away. So silver is much densely packed than something like steel or gold. Mm Mm-hmm. So what we're doing in the world of the Veilwalker is that we're allowing silver to be a much better conduit of the magical ability that these cre- these characters have. Mm-hmm. So it's not the silver itself, if not the spells that are being that's being cast on the silver is much more potent. So it's stuff like that that we're doing. We're taking a tried and true uh, tale, you know, something that you might consider a a trope at this point, and just putting our own twist on it. Uh, and I hope. You know, explaining the silver kind of gives you guys an idea of what we're actually going for. All right. Now, with with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, mm-hmm. um, give given the given the um given that inve- given that investigative um approach, I had looked at, I had, I had zoomed in a bit to look at the issue zero that's on that's on the that's on the page, and. What? There's a there's a few things that I'm cur- that I'm curious about. Um, one one of them is that is that whole alternate form that is, that's t- that um is used on the cover and it, and in that little issue zero teaser. Um, mm-hmm. is the significance of of that just that's the um that's what pe- that's what monsters think of when they think of the Veil Walker. No, I would, that's that's actually a good uh, a good metaphor there. No, that is a legitimate transformation. Mm-hmm. Um, what inspired this? I'll tell you what inspired it at first. Right, uh, was Devil May Cry because you seem like a gamer, so I know you, you probably played oh, Devil yeah. May Cry, right? Oh yes, I did. I've done. I did a whole episode on my uh, of my podcast just about character action games. I've 
cut my teeth on Devil May Cry for years. I love Devil May Cry. Mm -hmm. And uh, what inspired the transformation was the Devil Trigger from Devil May Cry. Mm -hmm. But obviously we went ahead and we put our own twist on it. Um, so that transformation actually has a purpose. It allows Alexander to sort of tap into uh, a larger amount of his energy uh, that he wouldn't be able to in his sort of normal mushy human form, all right? Kind of like that. My body won't take this much energy, so here's this transformation. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what it is. Uh, but the metaphor you made is great. Uh, but yes, when they tell the tales, right, of Alexander in the, in the veil, which is sort of the world that these creatures are coming from, they tell the tales of the veil walker. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's who, who they find to be an equal to them and who they actually fear, uh, but yeah, that's that's a that was pretty cool. I mean, you know what? That's exactly what I was going for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, of course, of course, with these with these kind of things, there's they're always any t any time you introduce um, su supernatural elements or just in, or just introduce um, powers that so that someone has, you've there's got to there's got to be drawbacks. Um, yes. In the since you brought up since you brought up Devil May Cry, the big the big drawback with that is it is it requ it requires it requires energy since Don since Dante is not a full demon. Um, of course, of course, some of that is some of that is game logic, but the but the point stands you you can only maintain that form for short amount of, for short amounts of time. And yeah, are there when it comes to that Veilwalker form? Are there similar um, are are there similar are there similar um, drawbacks? Yes. So, to be able to sort of get into that, I would have to explain kind of how the magic system works, right? Because we do uh, have a, a magic system that we developed. Yeah. I w so what I we was call get, it, I was going to get, I was going to to get into that as well, especially since consistency is key with it. Yeah, and it's it's one thing. It's it's sort of a mix between a hard and a soft magic system. Mm -hmm. Uh. Because we do know that we are going to have to develop it further as we start introducing more characters and stuff like that. Uh, but we want a lot of what we do to make sense and not just be because magic, right? There is an explanation for a lot of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in order to explain that, I'll tell you this. The people who are granted the gift, uh, there's a very small population of, of mankind who was born with an ability that's called the gift, or at least it's referred to, pe to the gift as people who actually know about it. And that gift allows you to use your mana or your spiritual essence, so basically your life force, to cast magic, right? So it is a sort of a pool of energy that recoups and expands through time and training. So if today you wake up, let's give it a let's look at it like a video game, right? Mm -hmm. If today you wake up with a thousand points of mana, uh, and you use you know five hundred, if you go to sleep and wake up tomorrow, maybe you're back up to seven hundred, right? But you can always increase your mana pool through training and through experience. Mm -hmm. So using this form is a huge, huge uh, leech to Alexander's mana pool. So it is sort of a break glass in case of emergency type mm -hmm. of thing. And uh, he needs to not just balance that form, uh, but there is a secret that we can't tell you guys about just yet. But he needs to balance that as well with whatever other magic he is using. So now why did we give our main character this sort of drawback, right? There are going to be uh, chapters and moments where Alexander has nearly no magic and where he will be at his most vulnerable state. Mm -hmm. And I think this really allows us to put him in danger, right? Because he isn't a, a, a Papa Sue or whatever you guys want to call him. Like this character does have flaws and he is not always the strongest person in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, and we really want people to understand that not only is he in danger, but the people around him are going to be in danger from time to time because he just might not have the energy to to protect everyone. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there are plenty of drawbacks. There are more that are coming. Uh, we just can't say too much without uh, giving away the the big twist of this first arc. Yep. 
Now, with that kind of thing in mind, when it comes to the magic system, you've described it as a mix of hard and soft. And yep. when I when when I refer to that issue zero, I see hit I see him using using certain using certain words when it comes to his magical effects. Is it a, is it a case where there are certain where there are specific wor- specific um words or or actions that ha- that have to be taken for spe- for spells of, for the effect, but how the spe- how the effect is utilized has has a lot of variance. Is that what you meant by a mix, or is it something else? No. So I'll say this. So let's let's touch on the words. Right. Mm-hmm. The words that he is speaking are Sumerian, because when he learned his magic. That's how it was taught to him. Those were the Sumerian, you know, kind of words of power in, in that respect. Mm-hmm. But someone who was raised, let's say, in Africa and has a different, not just a different language, but a different view on magic, you know, kind of like, let's say, you know, that, uh, what is it, a shaman or whatnot? So they're, mm-hmm. they're using the same energy but they're using it differently because of the region they come from, and that's just the magic development. Mm-hmm. So when I say a mix between hard and soft is, no, in his regards, every word has a particular meaning and a particular use. Mm-hmm. For example, if we're looking at the wusuru, which means release in Sumerian, yes, that one word can be used, or that one word and that one spell can be used for multiple purposes, but it will always be to release something. Mm-hmm. Release a spell, release a lock, release, you know, uh, a, a hinge on a door, right? Whatever you can think of releasing, flexible in regards to what we can use certain words and even what certain spells don't need a word of power. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, if you look a little further down in that spec script, uh, when he summons his magical sword, uh, of his pocket um he doesn't use a word of power uh, because the uh, cloth itself is already enchanted so all he has to do is provide some mana to it and it'll take the form or the shape that he's looking for be it a shield a spear a cocoon or as it is in the in the in the pages there a sword Mm -hmm. so we're kind of we're flexible there but we do want to maintain as consistent as possible all right i can i can get behind that now within 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 the uh, setup of within the setup of the world um you now as 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 i understand as i understand it um one of the key one of the key factions within the within the setting that's explored in this issue is the order of the veiled guard yes um now is now when it comes to when it comes to their approach, um, I ended I ended up half jokingly stating stating this in my notes, but I kept being reminded of like a magical Men in Black. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know what their 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 best comparison would be? Uh, it would be kind of like a mix between the Illuminati and like a mafia family, mm-hmm. but a magical version of the Illuminati or a mafia family, you know, or like a criminal organization. Even though they're not criminals, but they sort of function from the shadows. You know, they 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 work as a family, and they have these rules, these regulations, these codes that you just can't break. You know, once you're in the family, there's no way out. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of how I call it. I say the Veil Guard is sort of that. It's a mix between the Godfather, the Illuminati, and Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> when it came. Can- when it came to when it came to concepting um Veilwalker was it, I've had I've had plenty of um comic book writers on, on the show in the past and for some they ended up creating a character first and then built a world around that character whereas others built a world first and then built a character between the where do you fall into that paradigm right in the middle I'll say this, and uh, this is going to sound weird, guys, um, but I had developed 
the visual look of Alexander before his transformation. Mm-hmm. Where for in my mind, a lot of people would like, you know, Batman was probably it was Batman first, and then they drew Bruce Wayne. No, Alexander initially didn't have a transformation. It was just him. So I had drawn him up, you know, I kind of gave him the cloth, I gave him the sword, and I kind of just had this character design just sitting there, but I didn't really know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. Like, it was just a cool drawing that I did when I was 21. Uh, we started developing some things, added some features, this and that. We're like, okay, it's going to be a magical world, but we really didn't know where it was going to go until one day, and here comes The Witcher again. We're playing The Witcher 3, me and my editor, and I look over at him and I was like, dude, what would The Witcher be like if it was set in modern day? And then that was kind of like the light bulb for us. So, like, oh, you know that character you drew a few years back? That might be him. So I went to sleep that night mm-hmm. and I had a dream. It was a weird dream and it actually, that dream it turned into one of the arcs uh, in the future. But yeah, I had a dream. It played out all in my head. I woke up in the middle of the night. I made some notes. Uh, and I have been writing ever since. So I have developed the character first mm-hmm. without the world. Then I had an idea, like a concept for the world. And I developed them sort of in tangent together to the point that we are today. Yeah. Now, within the... Within... Within the set, within this particular issue, if I'm if I'm if I'm reading this correctly, um, issue one of Veilwalker is set. It would it be fair of me to say that it's set up kind of like a supernatural murder mystery, in ter- in terms of just fi- just figuring out what ex- what exactly happened. Yes, very much so. Uh, Alexander does not have an origin story. You know how most new characters and most comic books are, are you introduce the origin story. How did I get my powers and, and you know, what is the call to action? What is what leads this character to this magical world? No, with Alexander, we're dropped in to an already established experienced character. Uh, and there is something that happens uh, in this arc. It's not in the first issue, but in this arc that sort of acts as that call to action. Um, but I don't want to give that away too much. But yes, it, this is a murder mystery. You know, the first uh, I actually have it on the campaign is a Twitch streamer kind of just walks into uh, an old abandoned um, asylum and disappears while he's live on Twitch. You know, so the order has some connections. They shut down the stream and Alexander shows up to investigate and we kind of go from there. And when it comes to the way the order operates, is it a case where they um, where they give their agents, or in this case, inquisitors, a fair amount of autonomy, but you, but there are things you're expected to follow? Yes, there are rules and regulations. There's a code of conduct, right? Things you can and can't do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they go on a case by case basis. In Alexander's particular case, being the Grand Inquisitor or the leader of the Inquisitory branch. Um, he does have a bit of autonomy in regards to how he functions and where. Mm-hmm. This case was given to him because he was the closest person at the moment it happened. Usually he is not the one who shows up to these kind of cases. He is a last resort. But since he was already in, a, in the Salem, Boston area, they give him a call and he shows up. Mm-hmm. But everybody else sort of functions... Uh, on a case-to-case basis, they hand out cases, and uh, they have regions, they have different safe houses, so mm-hmm. that's kind of how they function. And with, so, when it comes to lower ranks, are they us- would they, in a more typical sense, would they be sent out in groups? Yes. Yes, there are uh, groups. So, that's a perfect question. Uh, my editor has been getting on me that I need to talk a little bit more about <laughs> the groups in the in the Veil vale Order or the Order of the Veil vale Guard. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, they they have a groups that are put together depending on a case to case basis. Usually there are groups of four, uh, but they can be as small as groups of two. Mm-hmm. And they're from different branches, different specialties. Right? There's the Inquisitor's branch. Uh, there's the Huntress branch. Uh, there's the Enforcement branch. So 
all of these people have different abilities that they have been trained uh, from the moment they were selected as young magicians because you need to be selected mm -hmm. to this uh, and trained from then. And yeah, they sort of function as groups. They go out uh, mission to mission and that might be uh, a story that we're going to tell sometime in the future. Yeah. Well, since you mentioned that Alexander doesn't have an origin story, at least one that you're not telling. Um, yet. Yet. Would it be fair of me to, to say that he that he'd have more in common with um with pulp characters who are who are already um who are est or established from the or established from the get go? Um. No, pe you know, people like say. It, I'd say I'd say the closest analog in this case would be something like Solomon Cain. Yeah, I mean, you could say that. So, now, but I have to explain why we're not telling an origin story, is because Alexander's origin story uh, is going to be part of a bigger mystery, part of a bigger story point, uh, and there are a few twists that are going to come from this origin of this character so yeah you know once we get started it, it, it's imagine a movie and the movie just drops you right and let's say you know perfect example john constantine the constantine movie like he is already an established uh you know paranormal investigator demon hunter you know demon hunter for hire whatever it is that he calls himself mm -hmm. uh, so that is basically you know a very close analogy in regards to how we're telling the stories like he's already established he already has a very high position uh, where the, the interesting part of the story is coming from is not from us telling you another origin story. It's from building a mystery around not just that origin story, but what it has to do with the order as a whole. Yeah. Now, in a lot of, um, in a lot of cases where, the, where you have a somewhat clandestine organization that the protagonist is associated with in some form or another often t oftentimes they'll um they'll have some sort of thing they'll have some sort of front that they use as a cover for what, for the real work whether it be whether it be whether it be just in whether it be just detective work in some ca in some stories or well in the ca in the case of um Batman Bruce Wayne is Batman with a mask off to protect Batman Yes. Um, do you ha is there something similar when it comes to Alexander where he has um, yet he, ha he has some sort of public f some sort of um, front for more normal people? Yeah. So the order is very private as a whole. Uh, what you guys are going to see is they have their own private communities. They have their own private office buildings. You know, they have all these things that all of them are are a front for something. Mm hmm. And Alexander, you know, when you meet him in this chapter, when he shows up to the crime scene, he shows up as a PI, a private investigator mm -hmm. uh, that was sent by someone else. So that is his front uh, and his cover. But you'll see that he has many, many different IDs or many different badges and titles and roles that he can roll out at any moment, uh, at any situation. So... So yeah, there are fronts, there are cover-ups, uh, very old and experienced organization uh, that has a lot of connections in, in very high, high places. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say this, the order itself is, o is older than most established world governments uh, today. And, be and because of because of that, they pro they probably have they probably have a lot of ho a lot of holdings and the like all over the planet. Yes, sir. Very um, much so. And you mentioned you mentioned families when it came to discussing the order. Is it a case where even even within the organization there are um, factions or di or differences of be of belief within it? Yeah. So the order itself functions uh, sort of as an electoral uh, hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So every single uh, major, let's call it continent, has its sort of leader or representative. And, and yeah, they have differences in opinions. 
honestly, I hate to make the comparison, the comparison in this sort of climate, but they kind of function slightly like political parties, where they all have their certain views and ways that they want to take the order. They kind of look over different branches. They have their underbosses. Mm-hmm. So, you know, let, let's call actually, you know what, let's call it less a, a, a political family and more like an extended mafia family mm-hmm. um, where there are sort of leaders and underbosses and all these people sort of have to come to the table and, and sit together from time to time to to figure out where they're going next. Uh, and there's going to be conflict there. Mm-hmm. Uh, like any family, like any group, like any organization, not everybody sees eye to eye. Uh, and it might get... It might get deadly. Yeah. And is it, within within the, within that would it be fair of me to say that even even in the, even in the even with his standing, there are some people who um, don't exactly care for Alexander's presence. You know the whole the whole you're st- the whole you're stepping it you're stepping into my turf, and I don't like your face either, kind of thing. Yeah. Look, look I'll I'll, I'll give you guys a. Uh, uh, some 411 here. The Veil Walker isn't something that Alexander refers to himself as. Uh, the Veil Walker is kind of an insult. Uh, because as I mentioned earlier, there's something called the Veil. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is where a lot of these creatures are coming from. And Alexander ga- gained this nickname or this, this sort of monocle, whatever you want to call it. Because he was w- the only person in recent history to spend... Uh, an extended amount of time on the other side of this sort of dimension portal, whatever we want to, we want to call that. I want to get too much information there, Mm -hmm. but yeah, so he spends uh, a set amount of time before the story even starts. uh, He spends, you know, a couple of days over there and he's one of the only people from his group of explorers to make it back. Uh, And he was called, you know, the veil walker. And it is more of an insult because People don't understand why, one, he was the only person to come back, why he came back uh, even stronger than he went in at one point. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's there's questions about what actually happened uh, in the veil. And these are all things that we would we'll get to in that story at some point. Because of that, would it be fair to say that a lot of, even a lot of people within the organization treat the veil as something you don't go you don't go too far in cuz you're not coming back yeah very much so uh people who it's actually a rule not to step through the veil um because you know the likelihood of you coming back is slim to none hence you know I'll give you guys a bit a, a large group went in with alexander and again he was the only one to make it back and yeah, it, the veil is is a dangerous, mysterious thing that even internally these these characters don't know much about because they just haven't been able to explore it or understand it properly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is one of the mysteries uh, that we're going to explore. There's a lot of mysteries here. There's a lot of things that we're going to touch on uh, that I hope that people really get eager for because you know this isn't a straightforward you know. M- monster hunting sort of story there's a lot going on there's a lot of conflict even again even amongst the the order itself Mm -hmm. and uh and yeah i think it's i think it's gonna be great i think you guys are really gonna like it yeah now you're shooting for about for about 25 pages if i'm not mistaken this Um, particular issue yes how do you how do you make sure have you ha- have you had any instances where um, you had to stop yourself from putting to, from putting um, t- with all these stuff you have to establish for this setting? So that was kind of one of the concerns that we have. Going in is with twenty five pages. How do we not overburden our readers with a lot of exposition? in this very first issue. Mm-hmm. So one thing we're doing is we're giving you guys a page uh, with a brief sort of explanation as to kind of what the setting is, what's going on, so that people kind of know or go or go into this with some type of knowledge so that we don't have to waste any pages or waste any dialogue giving you a bunch of boring exposition about 
kind of what the order is or what Alexander is doing or why he's here. So we're going to sort of drip feed you guys everything bit by bit. And we're going to let it sort of come to you naturally mm -hmm. as the story leads us to it. So we don't actually see, and I'll give you guys, here's a spoiler. We don't actually see the order of the Veil Guard until the end of this particular arc is when we're actually introduced to it. Because mm -hmm. first what we wanted to do is we want to introduce you to Alexander, his powers. We have a case here that needs to be solved, and we're going to show you how he solves it, plus the twist that I alluded to earlier. Then we're going to go from, here's one character, okay, now here's how this organization functions as a whole. Then we're going to move on to, this is how the world functions as a whole, and that way we're going to just progress steadily giving you guys more Mm -hmm. uh, are you an anime fan? Do you watch anime? Oh yeah. Okay. Did you watch one uh, One Piece? Yeah. Um, I ha I can I can I cannot say too much bad about One Piece because otherwise, um, the murder grandpa Minoru Suzuki might might find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't want that to happen. But I'll say this: one of the great things I think One Piece did was continue to increase the stakes. Mm -hmm. Right. Initially, they were part of this sort of small region that they made it to the Grand Blue and then from the Grand Blue, they made it to this other place. And this sort of just world as a whole just kept growing and growing and growing. And they weren't overwhelming us with too much information at once, like introducing too many different organizations or characters. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what we're going to do here is we're going to we're going to feed you bit by bit information so you understand what's going on. Uh, and then eventually, when when we blow the roof off of everything, you guys know why. You guys have been introduced to every major player, mm -hmm. and uh, and I can't say too much more without spoiling it. All right, I got I got gotcha. you. Now, with with all of the, with all of that in mind, um, what do you shoot? I I know you're. I know you're currently in the funding phase, and um, I want to congratulate you for getting for getting um, significantly higher than your initial than your initial goal. Um, Thank you. What would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Um, oh man, it's pretty quick, <laughs> pretty quick turnaround. Uh, I've been called crazy, uh, but the PDF version, uh, because everybody who backs gets a PDF version, is going to go out a few days after the campaign closes. Um, we're going to make sure that we know exactly who who funded, if anybody bounces, and we're going to give that a little time to to sort out. But we're going to send the PDF uh, practically the week of the campaign closing. And then the actual books uh, should be arriving to our first backers because we're going to try and, and ship it in order. Uh, mm -hmm. The books should be arriving to our first backers by Halloween, and uh, we should be done fulfilling, depending on how, how many, you know, how much the campaign grows. Uh, but we should be done fulfilling by early to mid November if it doesn't grow too much. Uh, but if it blows up, you know, we'll be fulfilling until maybe late November. Mm -hmm. And how appropriate to put this out on ho to, to try and put this out on Halloween? <laughs> that was actually a goal, man. That was a goal we were shooting for Halloween. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do. Uh, give me just a second. I don't want my computer to shut off. Here. Sorry about that. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do was make sure that we could try, at least put ourselves in a, posi a position to launch issue two on Halloween with a blowout Halloween stream, uh, some art for issue two. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that, that's kind of, that was the goal. Uh, but I want to make sure enough people get their book before we go ahead and, and, and uh, lock that date down. Uh, but my dream goal is yes, to, to have people reading the book by Halloween and launch issue two, or the campaign for issue two, on Halloween day. Mm -hmm. And I will certainly be keeping a be keeping a close eye on things, as I as Thank I you. often do. But with all of that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to the show and enjoy the madness at play here. No, thank you so much. I really appreciate all the great answers and, and you have really dedicated so much time to, to getting information out of me that maybe once I'm done with this, 
my editor is going to ring me and say, we gave too much away. Oh. That's what, exactly what he sounds like, by the way. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much for, for taking time out yourself to, to have me on and, and put a spotlight on the Veil Walker. Yeah. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And I was drinking. I'm not sure if you guys heard. Mildred, thank you so much again for having me. And I will most definitely be back to this beautiful temple mm -hmm. uh, that you have put together for us nerds, geeks, and just everything else. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate it. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>